Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to have you here joining us today to talk about application metrics. Just a quick uh, brief intro about my background. Uh, my name is Jessica Schlar, and I am a senior consultant with MBA Mission. We are the leading uh, admissions consulting firm. We've been around since 1994. And um, I have been with the firm since this is my fifth year, so I've been from five years now. Uh, I went to Harvard undergraduate, and then I worked in admissions for a small university out in California that no one's ever heard of. And because it wasn't a real popular school, I had to get in front of students in a different way than, um, you know, than people coming to us about the school. So I used to develop uh, presentations and workshops and travel around the country meeting with community college students and high school students and graduates, uh, potential graduate applicants, and take them through workshops on essay writing, on how do you clarify your values in school selection, and um, really loved that part of it, of helping people think through how to find the best school for them and how to best tell their story. Uh, during that process, I decided I was going to go to business school myself. I applied to five schools, and I was accepted at all five, Harvard, Stanford, Kellogg, UCLA, and Yale. I chose to return back to Boston, and I went to Harvard for business school as well. And I left admissions for a while. I did do volunteer work. I helped a lot of friends with applications. I did some volunteer work in the New York City public schools, helping high school seniors with their college applications. But for the most part, I was off uh, working. I was at American Express, and I was at J.P. Morgan Chase. And at, about five years ago, I was the quality leader and senior vice president at Chase Home Finance and uh, left there with the Bank One merger and was looking around for something to do and came across MBA Mission and have been here, as I said, five years and never been happier. I've worked with thousands of applicants, helping them assess their candidacy, tell their story, and figure out what's, what school will be best for them and how best to present themselves. So we're going to start that process right now, walking through application metrics. How do you assess where you are today with your candidacy so that you can make yourself stronger by the time you apply? whether you're applying in, in a matter of weeks or in a matter of months or years, there is stuff you can do uh, to, to uh, tweak your profile and to improve it. So we're going to give you some tools to help assess that. So what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, five things. The heart of this uh, presentation is numbers two and three. So we're going to be looking inside the mind of the MBA admissions officer. What are they thinking as they assess applicants? Two is the quantitative metrics they will be assessing you on. Three is the qualitative. And then we'll talk very briefly about us, and then I will take some questions. So let's get started. Inside the mind of the MBA admissions officer. What is the fundamental problem that admissions officers face in this business? Look at the numbers here, and you will see that it's scarcity. You have here Harvard last year got 9,000 applicants for 900 spots. Um, Stanford, with its lovely 6% acceptance rate, 6,600 applicants for 389 spots. There are excellent candidates and not enough places for them. So the issue admissions officers face is how do you manage this very scarce resource of classroom seats. Remember also that admissions officers are caught in the middle or placed in the middle of a web of different priorities at the school. There are lots of different constituents or stakeholders who want different things from the applicant pool. And, and so as the admissions officers are accepting and selecting their class, they are keeping in mind all of these other constituents as well. So you have professors. They want students who have real academic potential, who are going to engage in the class, speak up, challenge, offer other insights. The academic piece is really important to them. And they're looking for a fit. People who won't disrupt the class will be engaged and just part of the overall community. Students certainly care about the academic as well, but they're also looking for a network, a professional potential. How are you going to be a fit with the school and with your, your classmates uh, for the rest of your life? Are you going to be partners in business? Are you going to share resources? And then obviously, this is important to all of you, I hope, is a social fit. Are you going to have really good time while you're at school and enjoy yourself and find people to hang out with and make lifelong friends? Then you have the alumni constituency. Ooh, that one's really big. Um, the alumni want the professional component, too, because you become part of their network. So. Uh, they are looking. They, they would like the admissions office to accept 
applicants who are going to uphold the school's reputation, who are going to be a possible network for the alumni as well. Recruiters, we're all interested in what kind of job we're going to get after graduation, right? So recruiters are coming along, and they are interested certainly in your professional credentials and in your leadership potential. They want to know that you will be able to hit the ground running at your job on day one. And then finally, you've got the school dean, who's kind of the everything. He is interested in the school fit. He's interested in your academics, how you'll fit in the classroom. He's interested in your leadership, your professional aspirations. He is responsible for the brand of the school. And so when he looks at that list, and as far as we know, most admissions officers do work with the dean. They meet with the dean and to assemble the class at the, the last point where the dean will get a final look at the, the overall candidate pool that's about to be accepted. He's looking for, she is looking for the brand. Does this uh, class, as the admissions office has, has assembled it, is they, are they going to be people that the school will be proud to call students and alumni? So as you think about all the stuff you're juggling in your application, remember the admissions office is looking at it from a lot of different perspectives as well. It's really easy to feel like the admissions office is going down a checklist. And it's just not like that. They're balancing so many different constituents' needs and um, aspects of this process. So inside the mind of the admissions officer, um, this is how they assess. So they're going to assess your academic potential. And then what we're looking at here is what are the tools? What can you do to help them make a decision about your academic potential? So they're going to look at your undergraduate grades, the academic rigor of your class, um, graduate grades as well, your GMAT scores, professional designations. When it comes to your experience and your potential experience, they're looking to see what you've done professionally, community, uh, your personal accomplishments. And you, your mechanism for communicating that is all down here, your resume, your interviews your essays, recommendations. That's Your transcript is going to communicate this the, the grades. Here, you're going to be communicating through all the written work that you put together. Interpersonal skills come through as well in these written material. And obviously, the interview becomes critical here as well. I did an interview recently with the director of admissions at Cornell. And she said that 90% of their decision after the interview or about the interview is based on interpersonal skills. How how well did you fit with the recruiter, with the, with the, um, the uh, admissions officer? Not whether they personally, you know, you had a click with them, but just could they see you in the class? The She said the school is so concerned with building a community that once you get to the interview stage, the focus for the interview part shifts to really assessing how you are as a person, what, you're like, what you would be like as a classmate. So that's really important. And interpersonal skills come through in the essays and the recommendations as well. And then finally, this mutual fit with the program, this is reflected in all parts of your application. Uh, as you choose which kind of job you're looking to get, you want to demonstrate a knowledge of what kind of recruiters or industries the school is strong in. As you talk about why you might be a personal fit with the school, you'll talk about visits that you've had, networking, students that you know from there. Throughout the application, you can demonstrate uh, in subtle ways that you are a, a candidate who's going to really fit and contribute and has knowledge of the school. So let's go through some um, quantitative metrics. We're in the second section now that we talked about. How are they going to be assessing you? GPA, GMAT, designations, and additional courses. Those are, this is the most, I'm putting this in quotes, you can't see my finger quotes, but scientific part of the process. And it's really not all that scientific. Many of you are engineers right now, and, and it's probably really tempting to think that there's a, um, a formula here. GPA above X from a top 20 school uh, with a finance major will get you admission to this school, but not that school. And it, sometimes it feels that way. It can feel formulaic. It's really not. Every element, as I'm about to talk about, it, it's not as easy as uh, GPA above this or below that, or GMAT above this or below that. It's really a very holistic process. Um, given that, there are some numbers on this one more so than on the qualitative aspects. So what is a competitive GPA? Here are the average GPAs of some top schools. So it's pretty easy to look at this and say, OK, you know what, 3.5 is the floor. That's, that's kind of a ballpark. So, and that's, that's easy. And if you have a GPA that's a 3.5 or above, 
that's fine. You, you know, that's great. You don't have to think about that part again. It's not necessarily going to get you in, or not, but it's not going to keep you out. They will look and say, good, the grades are solid. But I wouldn't be giving this presentation if everything were an easy answer, right? It's not really as easy as a 3.5. The school is going to look at grading scale. Um, they're going to look at what school it was. There are many, many schools, particularly in the US, where there's grade inflation. So if you're applying from India, you may have a GPA of, or a aver class average of around 70%. In the US, a 70% would be terrible uh, overall. It would not be a competitive for the top schools. But in India, that can often be the very top of the class. So they're going to look at where you're coming from. How does your school uh, assess you? What was your major? 3.2 uh, or 3.3 in engineering my, is very different than a 3.2 in English, or my major was anthropology. I had to get a lot better than that with an anthropology major, and I knew that, to be taken seriously as an academic. Um, class rank, did you work? Were there reasons for the GPA being low if it is? Was there an upward trajectory? If you know some of you are sitting there saying, oh, I have a 3.2, um, it's too bad because my last two years were a 3.6, 3.7, that's great. That's really, you know, the schools will like to see that there was upward progress. You will probably want to explain that to them through the optional essay. Tell them that there's, that you worked for your first two years or you had uh, trouble adjusting. Don't make excuses, but give an explanation. And then focus them on how well you did the last couple of years. So they're going to look, did you take quant classes? They're going to look across the board at these. It is not a formula. And I'll tell you a, a trick to know that I'm right. If the schools had a formula where you have to have a certain GPA to get in, then they wouldn't spend their time reviewing applications of people who don't. They, wouldn't, they could probably reduce half their staff. They wouldn't have pay for admissions officers to be recruiting and marketing and, and going out there speaking with students if anyone below a 3.5 wasn't even going to be considered. Right? If you go back to the previous page, that scale I gave was averages. Think what an average means. Right? It's not or the median in some cases. This is half above, half below. So yes, you can get in. Those of you, when you start to take questions, if you find yourself typing, can I get in with? Can I apply with? If you can. They are not looking at a cutoff, because if they were, they would tell you that up front. Um, similarly, GMAT. So some of you are probably, actually, most of you are probably all staring at this number right here, right? Is that the number that you were drawn to? In this, it's now this, this current second year class at, at Harvard. But there was someone with a 490. There were people with 790. Um, look at their Wharton. You've got someone with a 560. Do I think that there are a lot of people with that? No, I don't. But their averages here, you know, if, if you sit down and say, oh, it's a 730. Um, I can't apply because I have a 710. Or I can't apply because I have a 690. Look over at this next column. Do I think that a lot of, not, don't think a lot of people are going to get in between 490 and say 650, but they clearly accept some. So look across, um, and you'll see now here uh, Columbia 680. That's that's pretty high for a bottom score. That may be the uh, the 80% range. Okay, so that's the asterisk here. So there are still people. 10% of the class is below this 680. Right, and 10% is above 760. So while it's easy to say 700, 80%, 80% split, it's not accurate. It's just that's the level at which you don't have to think about it again. I did it, good, can move on to the rest of the application. So they're going to look at the quant side, the verbal side, and they're going to look at your GPA. I did a free consultation with someone just yesterday who has a fairly mediocre GMAT score. Uh, Verbal was fine, the quant was a little lower, and it really brought down the overall score. Her GPA, on the other hand, is extremely high from a very good school, and a school that's known for being extremely quantitative and rigorous, and she had a double major in two very quantitative classes. So I do think that in her case, the GMAT will give them pause. The admissions committee will say, huh, that's kind of low. But I think when they then look at the rest of her profile, the conclusion they'll draw is, this is not reflective of her work. Now, obviously, she has to pick slightly safer schools and maybe fewer stretches. There are other things that she's responsible for, and she is taking it again. But remember that the schools do look holistically, and they will look at how these scores relate to your GPA. 
um, as well as they will look at the breakdown. Um, AWA score, you know, unless it's really low, they generally don't worry about it. Um, really, that's a disconnect to a you know, catch that you're writing your own uh, material. So, uh, you know, unless it's sort of drastically low, um, but I've never seen anyone you know, have a, a concern about the AWA. I've never heard an admissions officer discuss it in any way. The new IR section. Um, new this year, those of you who are, have not yet taken the GMAT will get to take the IR. It, it, uh, it Integrated Reasoning stands for. It is an experimental section right now, meaning they don't have data yet to interpret what it means. The GMAT is fairly predictive. They have years and years of experience to know that if you get a 680, you will perform on average at this level, what, whatever level correlates. So they don't have that yet for the IR. So at this point, they're data gathering. Um, it comes, the IR section in the GMAT comes before the other questions, so it's a little disconcerting if you have not prepped it and you haven't studied or you don't do that well on it to um, take this long section, this half hour section, and, and struggle with it if you haven't prepped it, and then try to sort of refocus your mind and get into the part that really matters. So it is worth studying so that you're familiar with it, so that it doesn't psych, it, you, psych you out when you get to the real GMAT questions, um, but it's not something you need to worry about obsessively at this stage either. What about the GRE? This is a really good question. Some schools take the GRE, some don't. So if you are someone who wants to take the GRE, your first step is to generate a list of schools that accept it, because that's going to be the population you can apply to. The next question that I usually get around the GRE is, am I at a disadvantage? Will they see that I took the GRE and assume that uh, it means I'm not qualified? No. The schools are not in the business of um, ranking their students or unfairly disadvantaging them. It's, you'll hear us sometimes we'll give a presentation. Um, you can find our free presentations on our blog, but we do one on interviews. And we tell people, if you walk into the interview and you're interviewed with a second year student, um, by a second year student in jeans and another candidate is interviewed by the director, it doesn't mean you are a less qualified candidate. They're not ranking you ahead of time or unfairly disadvantaging you over someone else. So it's the same with this. If they say we offer, we take the GRE and the GMAT, it's not a test. right? They're not saying, Ooh, but if you really pick the GMAT, then you're good. And if you pick the GRE, uh, automatically we don't like you as much. No, there's none of that. If they take the GRE, they consider it as equal to the GMAT in terms of their assessment process. There are plenty of people who take the GRE because they're thinking about applying to other types of graduate schools that require the GRE. It's not only about wanting an easier quad section. It's a, it's a different type of test. It's not necessarily easier or harder. It's just it's different. And there may be compelling reasons for someone to take that versus a different exam. Academic potential. Um, the admissions officers will also look at your other credentials. And you can see here is just a selection of them, um, additional classes that you take as well. This can help if you have a low GPA. One step you can do, take now, if you're applying in a year or two, and next fall or the fall after, build an alternative transcript. Take some classes. I'm working with someone who's a little bit older. He's been out of school a good eight to 10 years and uh, did not do that well. He would put himself through school, worked full time, has a terrific GMAT, which helps. But his academic credentials are both old and not as strong as his GMAT uh, reflects. So he spent a year before he started working with me taking classes, accounting, economics, and finance, and got A's in all of them. So now when he applies, he can say to the school, yes, my GPA is below what you're looking for, um, but please look at my GMAT and three recent classes in rigorous fields as evidence that I can do the work. So all of these can very much help your profile. I don't think they can make up for it. So if you have both a poor GMAT and a poor GPA, but you have PMP, you've taken a Lean Six Sigma class, you've got your green belt certification, I don't think that's going to offset you know, four years of a GPA. But for people on the bubble or people on the edge or where classes, your, your GPA might be not, not terrible, but just needs a little boost, these kinds of additional credentials can help. And certainly as the CFA, I think, is um, is more so than like a PMP or Six Sigma. If you, if you have CFA, that does give them more confidence in your quantitative abilities. So these all help, but I wouldn't look to them to replace. Um, they supplement. And um, 
what does all this give you? So they, admissions officers take your GPA, your GMAT, your designations, additional courses, and it gives them a, now we've been to qualitative for the qualitative metrics, a qualitative sense that you can handle it. It makes them feel some level of confidence that you can handle the program. All right, but those of you playing along at home, the question is, well, the answer is 70%. The question is, what percentage of applicants have academic statistics that suggest they can handle the program? 70% isn't enough. I'm sorry, the, 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 um, this formula above, the GPA, GMAT, having the academic credentials is not enough. The selection rates at the schools we're looking at, the you know, top 20 schools, are going to range from your Stanford 6% up to maybe 22%. If you go into second tier schools, you maybe you'll get up to 35, 40%, but there are very, very few US or any, any business school where they will accept 70% of the applicants. Um, so admissions officers can't just make this a formulaic GPA plus GMAT. They are going to look at qualitative data and qualitative metrics as well. As you assess your profile, uh, people can get caught up in their head and think, oh, admissions officers hate bankers uh, because they're um, part of the 99%, they're, they're, the schools feel guilty. Or other people say admissions officers love bankers, um, so I better become a banker. I better not be a banker. It, it's just, it's really, <laughs> it's really dangerous to start thinking that way. Your credentials are what your credentials are. At this point, you're not going to go back and get a different undergraduate degree, right? Um, sometimes I'll have these free consultations with someone, and they'll, I remember one just not too long ago. He was five years into a career. We got on the phone. He said, I'm from a really overrepresented demographic. I'm a uh, male Indian technologist. Uh, what can I do? I said, well, you know, there are steps we can take to help you showcase other sides. But what do you mean? He's like, well, should I have a different career? So you would know, think about step back, maybe retraining, maybe go in a different career, but it takes two or three years to build that up. And then you're going to be eight years, 10 years out of school and outside of the typical age range. And, it, and it's disconnected from what you've done. It's very difficult to go back and change what you've done. So don't, you can't change that, right? There are things in your control and out of your control. You cannot change your past. So uh, don't get caught up in whether admissions officers are looking for one thing versus another. They are trying to build a diverse class. And we have seen all these kinds of applicants. Sure, we see bankers and consultants and brand managers. We see PhDs. We see lawyers, um, teachers, professional athletes. Not a huge applicant pool. Military, definitely. Um, chefs, politicians. I mean, I'm thinking myself in five years here, I have worked with, I've never worked with an organic farmer. Um, but, you know, I, th I think every single bullet point on here I have worked with. I mean, it's, and I've just, you know, five years, but I'm just one person. So if I've done hundreds of applications, it's still not thousands that I've actually hands-on worked with as, as clients. So that's, um, you know, that just shows you the diversity. And keep in mind that the business schools are trying to build a diverse class. It's really important to them that their class not be made up 75% of bankers. They could fill their class with qualified bankers. They could fill their class with qualified Indian technologists who could handle the workload, no problem. But they don't want that. And do you want that? If you go to business school as a consultant, do you only want to have people with a consultant mindset in your class? The, uh, my hope is that, that, that no, that you have that in your workplace. And maybe at school, you want to diversify and get, get different perspectives. We have a whole presentation. You should try to sign up on our on our blog. We offer it a lot on um, admissions myths. And one thing we talk about, and school, another one on school selection, when you pick a school, don't fall into the stereotype trap. Kellogg is for marketers. Therefore, I if I'm in marketing, I must apply there. If I'm not in marketing, I can't apply there. Well, no. Kellogg doesn't want only marketers. They want people from all backgrounds. They may have a larger marketing pool than other um, other schools do, but that might be 20 or 30 percent of the class as opposed to 10 or 15. It's not going to be the entire class. So admissions officers are, do not come in with predisposed biases towards one profession or another. They are looking at the individual and at people. So whatever your background is, that's what it is. That's what we have to work with. That's what you should be, focus on presenting. So they are looking at promotions. Um, promotions are nice to have. It's a tangible credential of increased responsibility. But some careers, some jobs don't offer a lot of promotions. 
So what they're really looking at is increase in responsibility, evidence that you have grown over the course of your career. That could be project leadership, it could be um, mentoring, it, it could be uh, moving into more client-facing roles. Um, but you want to showcase that your role has not been stagnant in the two, three, four, or five years you've been out of school. So as you look at your resume, that's one way to show it. Make sure that the more recent bullet points show a bigger scope of responsibility, show a greater level of accountability to your job. You notice we put here initiation creation and italics end with an exclamation point. Uh, that's really important to them. They want to know that you can initiate, that when you see a problem, you can jump in and figure out a way to fix it without being asked, that you can come up with an idea, whether it's developing an internship program for your company or uh, one of my clients uh, was in investment banking where there's just not a lot of leadership opportunities. It's much more... Uh, regimented roles, structured roles, but he developed a language program for himself where he found someone who spoke a language he wanted to learn and they, just, they met once a week for a conversation, but he gradually expanded it. And over two years, it grew to about 70 professionals and 12 languages, and it was a spreadsheet that he managed. But it showed a lot of initiation. Um, he, every week he partnered people up and really added something to the company. And he did very well in the application process. So what, what it really comes down to is that admissions officers are looking for impact. What are they not looking for? Time served. They don't want, you don't sit there and look at your watch and say, oh, I have to apply in three years, so I better wait this extra year out. Um, just, okay, is it, is it time up? Is my time up? If you're just sitting around in your career not doing a lot, that's not going to be impressive to them. Even if you're at an impressive company, if you can't talk to what you've done, if you can't show impact, it's, the, you know, it's just probably not going to differentiate you. It would be competitive. Now, if your job is just sort of difficult, as I said earlier with the investment banker, to show that kind, that's when your outside activities may come more into play. But even look within work for opportunities that you can showcase that you have had an impact on the world around you. Goals. Um, as I talk, I want to just highlight down here this free download from our website. Write this down. If you go to our website, uh, and if you don't want to write this down, you can just go to our website, mbamission.com, click on Store, the Store tab. The first item is a free download. This is about a 30-page article that um, goes in depth on what I'm about to talk about for the, the next slide, a um, couple slides. When you you write your career essay. This is the essay that says, what are your short and long-term goals and why is this the school you want to go to? Usually how it's phrased there, it's, it, can, it can vary. Um, they want to know that you have ambitious goals that you need an MBA for, but that they're attainable. So take a look and just read this one. I was a software engineer, but when I get out of my MBA program, I want to work at a hedge fund. It's ambitious. Does it seem attainable? Is the goal credible? Do you need an MBA to get there? Um, and does your school help? It, hedge funds are, are really, really hard to get into. And they usually only hire people with hedge fund experience or with intense financial experience. So this is not a well thought out goal. It doesn't, it, it's not clear from this statement how uh, this software engineer is going to add value at the hedge fund from day one, which is what the hedge fund will be looking for. Go back to that first slide about who does the admissions officer have to uh, take into consideration. Recruiters. Recruiters want to know that you can add value. So I'm not saying that software engineers can never make the switch to hedge fund, but there's a lot of work to be done to prove that. And this essay will help with, uh, that I, uh, down here, will help with some of that. But keep these questions in mind. Are they credible? Do you need an MBA? Um, do, will I be able to add value to my job in day one, even if I'm a career changer? They're also going to be looking at your community profile. Um, they understand that some industries, investment banking, consultants who travel extensively, some other industries as well, make it really difficult to do community service. Um, and they're not looking for one particular thing. I, I've spoken to some applicants, uh, potential applicants who say, I have to do volunteer work, um, but the only thing I can do is a, uh, this, there's an animal shelter near my house, but honestly, I'm just not an animal fan. Well, they're not, this, is animal shelter what I should do? Is this, well, the schools like animal shelter. The schools want something that you're passionate about, and they recognize that everyone has diverse interests. So they're not counting hours. 
they're not requiring you to do community service. They want to see that you can have an impact. Um, oh, I thought that was going to pop up. Sorry. Um, they want, but it is the same as with the previous slide. It's impact that's important, not time served. We have a blog post called Community Service is Not a Prison Sentence that you can look up, which is really if you don't like animals, don't go look at your watch for two hours and sit there and sort of hide in the corner and hope the dogs don't lick you and then check off a box that said, I did my community service. You're not going to get an essay out of it. You're certainly not going to get a passionate interview answer out of it. It's not going to change your profile simply serving time. What you want to do is find something that you are really passionate about. What the opportunity that you have is to differentiate yourself from your peers, show leadership in an environment that if, you're, if your job environment doesn't really let you do that, here's an opportunity outside to show that you can motivate, that you can mentor, that you can take an idea and run with it, you can initiate and create. And you can re reveal both complementary and supplementary angles. You can add other dimensions to your background or you can add a, um, a deepen a background a element that you already have. I remember uh, maybe three years ago, I did a free consultation with a woman who had not gotten in anywhere in round one, and she called me in between to talk about her round two applications. And I asked her to talk me through the essays she had written, what she talked about, and it was clearly all work focused. So I said, you know, it seems to me that you haven't really focused on presenting the whole side of who you are. Is there anything outside of work that you're really passionate about? She said, oh, I don't do any volunteer work. I said, okay, well, you know, what about your hobbies or interests? She said, well, I like pottery. Okay, we'll go with that. How much, how much do you like pottery? She said, well, I have a studio that I go to um, for eight hours on one weekend day, and then I take a studio class for four hours on Monday nights, and I usually go to the studio um, about three nights a week and work. And as she talked, her voice got very animated, and I started scribbling down and like, counting up the hours. She was spending at least 20 hours a week doing pottery. And I said, did you tell the business schools about this? No, why would they be interested in pottery? So, if you think about the fact that the schools are looking for community fit, they're looking to see how are you going to add value not just in the classroom, but to the overall community, that's a huge part of herself that she was hiding from them. Maybe she doesn't want to go into pottery professionally, but maybe there's someone at the school who's interested in how do you open a uh, creative studio and she could offer insight. Who, who knows if it would lead anywhere? But the point is, this was a dimension of her character, her character, her personality that was so important to her that she spent 20 hours a week. I don't spend 20 hours a week on anything outside of my job. Uh, but she was spending that much time and didn't tell them about it. So they weren't getting a good sense of who she was. So you can really use your community service to differentiate or your community involvement, your activities to differentiate yourself. Admissions officers are looking for people, not just a GMAT score, a GMAT, and how, a, and how GPA, and how long you worked. They really want to get to know you. I was brainstorming with someone yesterday for um, Stanford. Right? Stanford's question is, uh, what matters most to you and why? And, and we were digging really deep into his background and why what matters most to him matters. And he got cut off. So he just sat the call later. So he emailed me and he said, I need a break. I think I'm going to start calling you Oprah. He said, I feel like I'm in therapy. Not all applications are going to put you through that level of emotional you know, depth, but a school like Stanford, where they ask you 750 words, they suggest, although it's flexible, what matters most to you and why? That's a kind of question you got to go in depth in. you got to really look at your soul for that one. Uh, Derek Bolton, the director of admissions there, calls it bleeding on paper. That's really what they want to see. So you want to show the human side of you. Um, hobbies and passions, triathlons, poems, commitment. There are no taboo subjects. There's taboo handling of certain subjects, but no off-limit subjects as long as they're handled appropriately. Almost no. Almost no. I could probably be pushed to think of one. But I'll give you another example. Uh, I worked with someone uh, recently who had been working with another consultant and wasn't satisfied with a different firm and switched over to work with me. And we sat down to work again. I was on her Stanford essay, What Matters Most to You. And we kept talking. We were brainstorming. I spent you know, an hour or two on the phone. And finally, I said, look, it seems to me that what matters most to you is um, this story we talked about with her religion and how she'd left it and found it again. And she said, well, yes, that is what drives me, but I can't write about religion. I said, why not? She said, my last consultant said I couldn't write about religion. I said, well, you can't proselytize. You can't like criticize other religions, but if you talk about yourself and your spiritual journey and how it's shaped you as a person, then absolutely you can write about it. And she was really nervous, but we worked very hard. And she's at 
the, um, a top five school now. I mean, she, she's at Stanford. So, you know, it's, she used that essay for other schools. So it's not, uh, don't hide who you are. Be conscious of how you're presenting it, but don't hide. All these activities, everything that makes you who you are is fair game, at least to consider for an essay topic personal leadership. And by the way, if you do have a question about this, uh, certainly you could ask it after the presentation, but if you have a question about your specific situation, I'll give you a link at the end of this presentation just to come on for a half hour pre free consultation with one of our consultants. And you can just say, look, I really want to talk about this particular experience. Can you help me think through how what an appropriate way to manage it is um, to present it? It's fine. We're happy to do that for you on the call. All right, assessing your fit is another one of the key elements that the school is going to be looking for. Um, MBA programs are not all alike. Here are lots of ways for you to assess the program. I'm not saying all of these are equal, right? For some of you, and they're not equal for all of you, some of you class size is completely irrelevant. For many of you, the facilities, what the building looks like is irrelevant. But for some of you, the facilities, what it feels like to be there, for those of you who are, whose environments really weigh on you, that's going to be really important. So these are just these are factors to consider in assessing your choice. But they um, do not, it doesn't mean that you have to weight each of these equally. Check um, our blog. We have an hour-long presentation where the, you know, this slide is a summary of an hour to an hour and a half presentation we give. But just real quickly, you want to look at reputation. Look at the rankings, but don't, don't stop with the rankings. There's much more to look at. Location. Some of you are saying, why does it matter if it's urban versus college town? Well, let me give you an example. Let's take Columbia Business School, located in Manhattan, versus uh, Tuck at Dartmouth in Hanover, New Hampshire. So those of you who aren't from the US or aren't familiar with it, Manhattan, big city, New York City, uh, about as urban as you can get. And Hanover, New, Hanover, New Hampshire is one of the most beautiful places on earth. But it's small, it's a little sleepy, um, very much in the woods, very rural, a pretty far drive from any city, um, very different environment. OK, so at first glance, some of you are thinking, OK, but it's two years. What's the big deal? Um, but it actually has a lot of implications. If you are in an urban environment, if you go to Columbia, you may have up to half the class or some large percent of the, of the class that lives in the tri-state area. They live in Manhattan or New Jersey or Connecticut, and they commute in. They're already living there. They already have their social networks. They want to get involved in school. They are really excited about Columbia. They'll be involved in clubs. But it's not the entirety of their focus. Whereas at a school like Tuck, there's no one living in Hanover if they're not associated with Dartmouth, so trust me. So they are, the class has all moved there. They're all like removed from their normal social settings. So therefore, their goal is to build a community very quickly with those people who are also at Dartmouth for two years. For some of you, that sounds amazing and exciting. For others of you, that will sound very claustrophobic. So it's not about what's right. It's about what's right for you. Um, class size. You can have a very intimate class of 200 to 20 at Yale or a more anonymous one of 900 at Wharton or Stanford, which is right for you. Uh, the teaching method, lecture is a little more passive. You sit there and take notes. And for some people who don't like to speak up, that can be a really good way to learn. Case method, which Harvard and Darden do exclusively and the other schools, some of the other schools do heavily, is very uh, much on the spot. You are engaged. You're having conversations. Your professor is only very gently steering the conversation where he wants it to go. Here's another one that people think, well, why does it matter, the mandatory core versus flexibility, with lots of implications. Chicago Booth has basically no requirements. So that means when you get to campus at the beginning, you are responsible for your curriculum. For some people, that's incredibly exciting. You know what you want to do. You're trying to impress recruiters, and you're all lined up to upload, you know, front load all your finance classes. For others of you, business school is a huge transition. You're new to business. You've had a background. Maybe you are one of those organic farmers. And you don't want to, you, you just are trying to adjust to Chicago, adjust to business school, and figure out like how, what, what this is all about and how you're going to use it. And you don't want to pick your classes yet. You, you, have, you don't have a business background. You want to know, be told what it is you don't even know before you start picking. So maybe for you, um, having a, class, a school with a core curriculum is important. Maybe you're going to one of those large schools, but there's a course so you get to see the same familiar places. Whereas at Booth, with everyone taking different classes, there isn't that shared experience, that classroom core group that gets built. On the other hand, everyone's in that boat, so maybe they work harder to make friends. There's no right or wrong answer. 
So I just went on a little long, but I, I love this subject. It's really important to me. And uh, we have the presentation on it, so try to check that out. Free, free presentations. So you want to get to know your programs. Certainly, the, the school's admissions blogs are important. We have a blog where we've interviewed admissions officers, and we offer uh, alumni reflections on schools. Uh, insider's guides, we publish them for the top, approximately the top 15 schools, uh, which we do in our off-season. So they're 50 to 70 page books about the various schools' programs and give you some inside look. Definitely go to chat boards. The admissions officers host um, Q&A sessions all the time, too. But you can do more, especially if you're not applying this year, but you're in this session now to prep for next year. Visit campuses. If you can't visit, that's OK. Uh, the visits are not for them. The visits are for you to get to know the school better. Meet with alumni. Meet with students. But I don't know any students. In today's social media age, you don't need to know students. You can post up on your Facebook page, I'm looking for anyone who's recently graduated from or goes to NYU. Can anyone help? You know, likely you're going to find someone. If you can't, call the admissions office. I'd like to speak with a student. Is there an admissions ambassador? If you don't feel like doing that, go onto the school's website. Look for the clubs. You'll find the, the school's club officers uh, with their email addresses. Email them. I'm interested in the consultant club. Can you tell me about it? You know, do your research. Be respectful. Don't ask you know, how many in the club, what the club's activities. I'm sure the club has a website. But it, you, you want to get beyond that. But um, but they're there. Their, their emails are out there for you. And that's a really good way to assess fit. And again, the fit is for you to be able to tell them why you would be a fit, to be able to speak intelligently in your essays and your interview about why this school is a good choice for you. They are not checking on a list how many info sessions you go to and whether you visited the school. But they will want to know, do you have a good understanding of who, who we are as a school? How do you express your fit? Here's a, um, an example. Columbia is a great school for entrepreneurs, and New York is an exciting place for me to take professional risks, so, as so many great fortunes have been built in this city. I really believe that the Lang Center for Entrepreneurship offers the wealth of resources necessary for me to take the next steps as an entrepreneur. Think about that. Do you feel like you know the applicant better? Do you feel like they know very, they've expressed to you much about the school or the fit. They've done some research. They know that the Entrepreneurship Center is the Lang Center, and they know that it's in New York, and the school's in New York. But there's not an awful lot of substance here or compelling reason for the admissions officer to say, yeah, I think this person's going to go here. Remember that one thing that's really important to the school is yield. They really want to accept someone and have that person accept them in turn. So they're going to be focusing on, do we really believe this person wants to come here? Here's a different off, um, answer. As an aspiring entrepreneur in the online education field, I know that flexibility will be crucial to my success and that I will need to constantly challenge my assumptions. For this reason, I would seize the opportunity to participate in the entrepreneurial sounding board process by scheduling a session with Russell Sarder, whose vast experience in online education will no doubt lead to an invaluable critique of my ideas. Thereafter, I would hope to take my refined concept to the Lang Center's incubator. Do you see how much more detail and how much this applicant, this hypothetical applicant, and don't copy this. This is an example. Um, do you see how much this applicant has uh, tied the school's resources to their specific career? This person above, it's just uh, it's entrepreneurs, uh, professional risks. But here it's, I'm looking to do online education. And look, I want to come here because Russell Sardor is on in online education and will be helpful. And I know more than just the Lang Center name. I know the process that I can use here. This is a much more detailed way to uh, convince the school that you are a good fit. So let me summarize this up before I tell you a little bit about MBA mission and take your questions. Um, assessing your MBA scorecard. You want to try to do this for yourself, especially those of you who are a little bit uh, further away from applying. Th this kind of assessment can be a really good way to fill in the gaps and, and uh, figure out how you can improve your profile between now and then. So you, And if you have trouble with this, get a free consultation with us, and we'll walk you through a profile review um, and, and help you figure that out. So here's a hypothetical candidate number one. What's the attribute the schools will assess? For um, GPA, they have a really strong GPA. 
and they have a really strong GMAT. Um, they've had a master's degree or they've taken other classes. So they've got you know, good, good GMAT. I'm sorry, good academics overall. They've done a great job with their professional impact. Uh, they've really made a difference at work. They've done stuff outside where they've shown leadership and shown interests. They have goals that are realistic but still ambitious, whether they're a career changer or not. There's, a, there's some grounding in transferable skills. Um, really strong. Didn't articulate the fit with the program. Uh, very generic statement that they wrote. And they really didn't express, they didn't sell themselves through their essay, their recommendation, their the short answers was a direct copy from their rec from their resume. Their recommenders wrote generic answers that weren't supported, you know, glowing, positive, but weren't supported with detail. Overall, this is not going to be a particularly strong applicant. The credentials is there, but the execution is not. This reminds me of a, a quote I read once in an interview with one of the admissions officers at um, University of Michigan, Ross School of Business. He said, at some level, I love rejecting candidates with 780 GMATs, well above Ross, Ross's average, because they apply and they think, oh, I have a 780, the school will want me, and they don't put anything else into the rest of their application. And we don't accept people like that. Your GMAT is not going to get you in in isolation. A stunning GMAT score is stunning. It's wonderful. It's better than having a bad GMAT score. But it's not enough. You still have to execute. You cannot think of Ross as a safety with your GMAT score if you still don't take a really strong, rigorous approach with these last two, presenting yourself well and demonstrating that Ross is a fit. Otherwise, the school will look at him and say, oh, he's a, it's a, he thinks we're a safety. We're not going to accept him. So be sure that you really demonstrate fit and then you execute on your application. Here's another person. Academic ability is OK. GMAT's good, though. They improved. And nothing. They don't have any professional designations. It's completely neutral. Doesn't help, doesn't hurt. Um, have made a good impact and have some activities outside of work where they've shown leadership. Their goals are strong and well articulated. They really demonstrate a good fit, and they've executed really well on their application, showing multiple sides of themselves, uh, making their essays interesting. So overall, this is going to be a stronger candidate, even with that lower GPA. This is not a formula. I know some of you are sitting there saying, I wish it were. My GPA is really strong, but I'm not that sure about my activities outside of work. Hopefully, you have time now to fix that and to start to address some of these things. And academic, you know, look, good grades are great. Again, better to have good grades than not to have good grades. But if you don't have them, there are still, there's hope. You still have a strong chance at a decent school. All right, let me tell you just very quickly about us, and, and then I think we're going to turn this over for questions. So MBA Mission is a admissions consulting firm. And there are a lot of firms in the space. I will tell you what makes us different is that uh, our consultants are all full-time. What does that mean? It, just like the example I gave on school selection, urban um, or uh, rural setting, it's, there's more than just the surface to, to the explanation of why that's important. The fact that we're all full-time means this is our profession. We take this seriously. We're at work every day, from morning to night and often late at night. We're not squeezing our clients in around our uh, the rest of our job. We're not taking a, a break on our lunch break to read an essay or, or rush, and if our boss calls us over, we're going to have to cancel your meeting. This is our job. This is what we do. Also, because we're full time, our experience is really vast. We will help you start to finish. There is no problem we have not seen. One of us hasn't seen. And also, because we're full time, we're a real organization. We're not just a website with a bunch of part time consultants. We know each other. We meet in person. We meet on the phone. We meet regularly. We train. We have shared databases. We have shared experiences. We send emails to each other all day long. I have a candidate who's got this issue. Has anyone seen anything like it? How do you think my client should handle this? Can you review this essay for me? We're a community working for you behind the scenes. Uh, MBA Mission is the only consulting firm that uh, Manhattan GMAT recommends and that Kaplan recommends. We guide you through the whole process, start to finish. So we do assessment, brainstorming, um, outlining, unlimited essay editing. We guide you on recommenders. Uh, resumes, interviews, um, and then that's our full, complete start-to-finish package. We also offer 
uh, more specific, less expensive, and more targeted practices. So interview prep, hourly reviews, a boot camp, which is an amazing three-day, it's like four hours a day at night, um, immersion either in person or online with about 10 applicants and a consultant, and you also get one-on-one -on -one time. It's about 10 hours worth of work for about the cost of two or three hours of hourly. Boot camp is, is terrific. Um, just highlighting some of our teams, Jeremy is from Darden, he's our CEO, former speechwriter. Uh, Katie went to Harvard Business School and Harvard Law School and was at McKinsey and read ex um, admissions for Stanford. Monica co-wrote 65 successful Harvard Business School application essays. Akiba has three Harvard degrees, um, college, business school, and Kennedy School. So Lynn was the former managing editor of Fast Company and Inc. So there are, we have a lot of credentials in writing. We're all writers and MBAs. So we, we know what we're talking about, and this is what we do day in and day out. Um, and then I'm going to leave this slide up for a couple minutes. Here's some free resources. Our blog, we have interviews with admissions officers, we have essay analyses, we have admissions tips, we have interviews with alumni, we have just a lot of stuff, our blog posts constantly. This is the link I gave you earlier to our free personal statement guide, and also here is you can get a free consultation. Just fill out the form and then we'll, we'll send you a link to a scheduling site and you can look at the bios of our consultants and pick someone who you think will be a, a good fit for you. And then our blog also has lots of upcoming events, we have a ton of free presentations, so and you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. So thank you for spending this time with me today, and I am going to um, start to take questions. Thanks so much, and best of luck with your application.